Hello, elementary administrators. This Bite Size PD is for you. Um, the topic for today is, or for the screencast, is Canvas for K2. And in full transparency, when I developed this presentation, I did develop it specifically for K2 teachers. So the examples that I'm going to share are specifically from Canyon's K2 teachers, and not just online teachers. It's a mixture of online and in-person. And it's even some teachers who were online who then moved to in-person and, and continued their practice. But even though it says for K2, I think this presentation could actually be beneficial to teachers K-12 and specifically our K-5 teachers. Um, this is the same presentation I did and gave at District Day, so it's going to be very familiar if you were there and watched it. But I wanted to make another recording specifically for administrators one, because I know that there was a lot of information pushed out to teachers and admin during district day, so it's a great reminder to go through this again. But then also, I want to talk to you as administrators. I want you to look look through these examples, think about what I'm sharing, and think about how one or this could work for your school, how this could also um, help your students, your community stay connected to the learning. Um, really think about the possibilities of how this can support your students, your parents, your teachers. So the learning intention success criteria, I'm learning how Canvas can be used in the K2 classroom with the caveat of how can this be used in my school. Um, I'll know I'm successful when I can identify ways in which Canvas can be used in my classroom, in my school. So <clears throat> as a reminder with the why, I think my biggest soapbox with Canvas lately has been the reminder that Canvas is a learning management system. Yes, it can do assessments. Yes, there is a way to assign things in Canvas, but ultimately it was designed to be that learning management system. When I think specifically about our elementary classrooms, I think about how many various programs, how many different directions students will, will need to go or things they need to access. And what Canvas can really do is help bring it all together. It can help them not have to remember which website to click on or where to what website to use. Um, Important information can be shared. It can help students stay connected to the learning. That's why I have connection to learning there. So if students are absent, if we have a snow day, um, how can students stay connected to the learning beyond just a packet? Um, I always share this example, so you may have heard me say it before. When I taught fifth grade, inevitably I always had kids absent. Um, I'd either have kids gone for a week on vacation, or I remember I had one girl one year who consistently missed Fridays. Very interesting. Um, and every time they'd come back from being gone, for no matter what the reason was, the first question I'd always get from them is, did I miss anything while I was gone? And at that time, I didn't have Canvas to use. So I was always pulling together different worksheets, different packets, and then sending it home. Canvas can be a great way if a student's absent, I can say, hey, there's a module in Canvas that has a link to the centers that we did or the skill-based instruction, or there's a video I want you to watch, or there's a quiz you can take, or there's some content there that you can access to help them stay connected to the learning. Uh, coherence is listed um, on this list for why, just for the consistency. Um, continued feedback that we hear is just how nice it is to have consistency among schools, among grade levels, even among subjects. So knowing that Canvas is heavily used in our middle school and high schools, having students starting to use um, Canvas in the elementary classroom can really help with those transitions. And also it's a way for parents to stay connected to what's happening in the classroom. And yes, I know you all have wonderful, wonderful websites that has great and important information there that you want parents to access on the school website. But when it comes to the individual classroom, um, that's where having them just go to the school website can be a little lacking. So it's nice for parents to be able to know if I go to the Canvas course at the homepage, I know what I'm going to get. Um, if I go to modules, I know what content I can access. I know what the navigation is going to look like. So that coherence can really help with the connection to learning and then that communication with parents and students. And then... <clears throat> Something that was new last year, I don't think it got started or I don't think we were able to really figure it out until the middle of the year, maybe February-ish, but students can now sign in with Clever. Because I know the login for our little, specifically K-1-2, was a little tricky, but now they can actually sign into Canvas like they do with the, all the other programs with Clever. So something that my team did, <clears throat> we actually wanted to look at the K-12 Canvas Expectation and Style Guide and really identify for our elementary teachers 
our must do's versus our can do's. And once again, this was shared at district day. So this is what all teachers heard. Um, the must do is setting up their teacher account settings. Um, I strongly recommend having a, a profile picture. Um, that's still amazing how many teachers don't have a profile picture or they have like a tree or it's a scenery picture or it's a cartoon. I always recommend having an actual picture um, just to kind of help put a face to a name to humanize the person behind the screen. And then setting up the notification preferences. Um, Canvas does allow them to get emails. Um, there's even a way to set up text messages if that's the preference. And then the optional one is to identify pronouns. <clears throat> Oops. Um, when it comes to course navigation, we do have the course navigation recommended. Um, once again, that's for that consistency. And you'll notice our navigation is pretty similar to what we expect for K-12. It's the recommended ones that are optional. Oh gosh, sorry, it keeps moving. Um, the recommended ones are optional based on what's being used in the classroom. And then we do recommend that they use the Canvas course that is created by this, the Canvas Skyward Sync. There are a few teachers out there who don't get that created for them, more like your, your SPED teachers. Um, in that case, they can create their own course, but that Canvas Skyward Sync is a great way to help um, with the rosters because it should automatically update when students are added. Um, but something for you as administrators to know is that Canvas Skyward Sync is very dependent on what's enrolled in Skyward. So that's usually when if there's an issue with the teacher not finding a course or students not appearing in a Canvas course, we usually have them talk to your administrative assistants to really look to see um, are students enrolled, are the courses created in Skyward. And then the last must do is that course homepage. Um, every teacher K-12 in our district using Canvas should be utilizing that Canvas course homepage. And I'll talk about the requirements of that homepage in just a moment, but that is that landing page when students go, students and parents go into that Canvas course, um, a great way to get information once again, stay connected to the learning. And then the can do's are the content pages, the assessments and the modules, all of which I'm about to show you some specific examples. Um, one thing that I didn't color code is the recommended design element. This is something I strongly recommend that you, you look through and think about um, this is just applicable to any teacher. It's a way to support them in their course design, um, really thinking about the images that they're using, that they're representing, the diversity, they're representing real people, um, thinking about the length of content pages, think about your own experience on a web page. If you have to scroll a lot, you tend to tune out. Um, you kind of want things right there in your face, quickly accessible. Um, and thinking about accessible, you want to think about accessibility. Um, I, I shared the experience of a first grade parent who was participating in online the online school last year, and it's a parent with a visual disability. And a lot of the content was not accessible. And yes, um, the student her student was not the one with the, the the disability, but the parent is at home trying to support a first grader. So really thinking about how we can make content accessible for those parents who are supporting. Not a must do, but it's just something to keep in mind of what can you do to really support and make that content accessible. And I'll let you read through the rest, but a lot of it is just really thinking about that course design, the design elements in supporting the people who will be accessing your Canvas course. So thinking about the course homepage, and this is identified as a must do, I want our elementary teachers to know if all you use in your Canvas course is the homepage, that's okay. Now I have less is more listed because I've seen teachers create some really wonderful home pages, and some of these wonderful home pages are a lot. <laughs> and sometimes when it's too much, it can be confusing, even though it might seem obvious that the information's right there. Anything they need to know is right there. Sometimes if it's too much, um, the users get overwhelmed and they just they'll miss it. So less is more. You want to think about your audience. You want to think about how you can provide visual representations. The example is buttons and the buttons you're seeing on this screen. This is actually a template that I got. I'm using that we've provided to teachers. Um, it's found in Canvas Commons. We have tons of Canvas templates available for our teachers to use. So they're not starting from scratch. And these buttons are editable in a way where if I don't like that, it says class news, I can change it and tailor it to what's applicable in my classroom. Um, and then with the style guide, so you think about the multimedia element is one of the requirements. That's what the, the images do. You want to have your teacher name, course name, a welcome message, 
contact information. The course norms, expectations, and how-tos really vary based on how the teacher's gonna be using the class, the Canvas course, and they can be found on any of these buttons. They don't have to be listed on the homepage. It can just say, hey, for course norms, go here. Expectations, go here. Sorry, my mouse is so, so sorry. So touchy. And then any links to supports and the schedule. I actually stole this from Cynthia Carling, one of our teachers in our district, who she just creates um, an image that has, here's our weekly schedule. And I always share the example of, um, so when I was in elementary school, my mom was very good at checking me out during lunch or recess. So I never missed the important things of the day. There's other parents I think that would do that. So having this schedule right here so they can say, oh, Thursday, here's what's happening. Um, just kind of a way to help even parents know what's happening on a week. And it can be on a daily basis as well. The schedule really can be um, set up what works best for the teacher. So this is the non-example we shared at district day. I'm not going to pause and have you look at this and then tell me what's wrong with it. But I wanted to identify what I was identifying what was wrong with this presentation or this homepage. Because I've seen a lot of teachers make these same mistakes. Our teachers love going to teacher pay teachers and finding the cutesy fonts. I do too. But if I'm making this course for a kindergarten, first grade student, I don't want anything cursive and possibly not even capital. I don't know. Depending on my students, this they may not be able to read. Um, I'm not opposed to Bitmojis. I love the Bitmoji classrooms. I've seen teachers be very, they've made really awesome ones and get really creative. But you want to make sure you are including a real face to a name. You want to um, really personalize the person. So if you have a Bitmoji, somewhere you want to have a picture of the actual teacher. That welcome message, I had a few teachers say, that might be a little bit too long. How can you condense it so it's a little bit more in your face, easier to digest the information? Um, it's very busy with the buttons. Um, this specific template I found on Teacher Pay Teachers, I think it's cute. I love I love black and white. I love the little flowers. But would this really um, connect with a first or kindergarten student? No. I want to use images. I want to use a lot like what I have on this screen. I want to use something colorful. I want to use something that makes them want to go to my course. Um, but also something I'll say about three, four, and five students. This um, template may be too, too elementary for my third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade students. Um, I actually took a web design class over the summer or webinar and I was they really talked about finding images that really connect with your students. So while I think this is cute, this may not actually want, my students might be like, uh, oh, it's so boring because it's more of an adult theme than it is an elementary theme. So when it comes to content pages, I want everyone to remember that the homepage, a teacher's homepage, it actually is a content page. You're just creating a home page, a content page and setting it as your homepage. Um, but with all content pages, you want to make sure less is more. You don't want it to be too long. You don't want it to be too complicated, too confusing. You want to remember who your audience is when you're creating and designing the page. Um, and your content pages can be linked directly from the homepage. So the homepage you're seeing right now, I'm not planning to use the module section at all of my Canvas course. I'm just going to use these buttons on my homepage to link to important resources. So if I'm working with students, I can say, hey, in Canvas, we're gonna go do our skill-based instruction now, click on the button, that's gonna have all the directions that you need. Uh, maybe there's direct links to Reading Street, or maybe I have specific information for parents I want them to quickly access. Um, I did watch something from UEN, the Utah Education Network, where they were talking about screencasts you can make to help create some visual cues, um, or even verbal cues, and I think I need a little bit more practice with this, but if I'm creating a screencast for students or parents, I could even use my, you know, hey, click the button above me or click the button below me over here. It's a way to maybe provide some visual cues in my screencast that I'm embedding on my page to help direct people where to go. So I'm going to show walk you through some tasks and assignments because we're now into the can do. It's not the must do section, the can do of Canvas. So when it comes to task and assignments, here are the examples I'm about to show, but I want to stress the importance of just because something is shared and accessed in Canvas, it doesn't mean it has to be completed or submitted in Canvas. Now, as administrators, as you're going through these examples, what I want you to think about how can your teachers even use this if, if they're not doing it? Um, well, I don't want to say that. 
how can this even just support snow days? Because I know all of your teachers are supposed to have a plan for what if there's a snow day? How can we continue that learning? Or how can I use this for sub plans? If, my, if I know I'm going to be absent or my teacher's going to be absent, how could they use this to support maybe some sub plans? Um, and maybe they could even have a module. Because I even, I'm all about using what I'm creating and not just creating something for the heck of it. Because um, I don't want to create a sub plan or even an emergency sub plan or, or snow day plans that aren't applicable. I don't want it to be busy work. I want it to actually be meaningful to my students and to myself because I'm going to be grading whatever it is they're working on. Um, and I don't want them. I just don't want, I don't want busy work. I'm just going to say that right now. So think about how these examples can maybe support things like snow days, emergency sub plans, because I even think you could have something that I'm planning to do, uh, or maybe I have it in my, I, maybe I'm thinking four weeks ahead. I'm like, I'm going to have this in Canvas just in case I need a sub plan or there's a snow day. And maybe those, I get to that point. And I'm like, I haven't had a snow day yet. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and do that activity now. And then I can plan for something four weeks more in the future. Like create something you're actually going to use. Um, maybe not right away. Something that you can always um, come back to later. I think I rambled a little bit, but I'm hoping you're starting to think, um, have some ideas, have a growth mindset, just, be open to possibilities. So this first example, I'm not going to play the screen, this video from the teachers, um, is from Crescent Elementary teachers who have been using ECRI. So the first two days um, are in person, it's very explicit instruction, but then for days three and four, they're using Canvas as a way to support independent practice. So they actually use Canvas as a way to provide another screencast from the teacher that, that students will watch and there's a task for them to complete. And during that independent work time, the teachers are either calling students back and working with small groups, individual students, or they're walking around and checking in on the student work. One thing that they're not doing is they're not just putting on the students on the computers, sitting at their, their, at their desk, working on something else. They are using this independent time while students are actually working and completing their tasks to be checking in on individual student needs. Um, I had another example is the skill based instruction or center station rotation, whatever, whatever your teachers may call them. Um, the first example is one I actually stole from a teacher who's not in our district. Um, there's someone who used a, uses a program called Seesaw, which we don't use, but I took the same idea and I actually made, I used a table and created this, um, kind of like this chart of like, okay, here's my groups and here's the different station rotations and teachers do this. They actually, most times will have this on their board and they're manipulating it on the board every week. But anytime they see a picture of me, the teacher, they know that's when they're going to meet with me. And then if they're on the words center or station rotation, they can click on that and there'll be a canvas page that will actually um, give them a screencast from me with directions of what the task is going to be. And then I have something for writing. I have something for reading. Now, I actually have told teachers I am willing to share this with them. I've actually already shared it with a few teachers um, so that they can then take what I've already created and then manipulate it to be what works best for them. Um, another teacher, and this came from a teacher in our district who um, was using the module section as a way to help support her ELA centers and her math centers. And you'll see where she has like a dictation center, a stamping center, and so forth. And this video is actually an example of... I'm actually going to pause it. But anyway, you can watch this video separately. And this video will, um, I'm stopping it because I'm really recognizing it's not the video where I made sure I edited faces out. I'll update this before I um, post it online. But you can watch that video and you're actually going to see the video pan around um, the room and the kids are engaged. They are watching the screencast from the teacher and they are completing the task. So once again, I think about if a student was absent or if we're having a snow day, I can say, hey, in our Canvas course, there is a center. Why don't you go ahead and work on that, that content, that material? Um, this example actually came from um, Megan Malin, where she embedded a screencast. It was actually a writing assignment where they were using a Venn diagram. And what I love about this is in the, in the um, video, she actually holds up the paper that the kids are also going to be working on in front of them. And she's showing them, talking through what they're going to be doing. Now, what's awesome about this task is she's just using Canvas as a way to provide the directions. So if a student watches this and then forgets what to do, they always can come back to it and listen to the teacher's directions again. Now, 
This assignment is not something that she's having them submit on Canvas. She's just using this as a delivery tool. And then the paper's there, they can turn it in like they normally do with other tasks that they complete in class. Now, what I did is I took Megan's example and I just added a webcam submission option. So the teachers can actually have teach students submit their work on Canvas. Um, the webcam is actually a pretty neat feature where it's just clicking the blue button and they, it enables the camera on their the, the device, whatever they're using, Chromebook, iPad, and they can actually hold the paper up front and it actually does the flipping so you don't have to worry about flipping the paper and they can actually submit it to um, Canvas for the teacher. And then that's where the teacher could use the speed grader to provide feedback to look at it or they have this so at parent-teacher conferences they can pull up this writing assignment right then and there and show parents and even show parents how they can access it when they're not at conferences. Um, something that's been new this year is um, the ability to connect Savvis to Canvas. Now, so what we call the LTIA, so if you ever hear that, that's what they're talking about, but it's a way to bring in reading street material, bringing in the Savvis math. Um, it can just be the video, it can be the practice buddies. Um, their uh, workbook could actually be that, that content as well. So students can actually access that Savvis material right in Canvas without having to actually go to the Savvis website. And when I say it connects, so a teacher can actually grade it um, here in, in Canvas, and it also um, has the grade in the Savvis platform as well. But last year, what a lot of our teachers were doing, if you aren't aware of this, is they were actually trying to embed all the Savvis content on their own using something called iframe um, or downloading videos. And that's where I got a little worried about copyright and we connected with the Savvis people. And that's how we learned about the Savvis LTI. So just a great way just to bring in that reading street and math content. Um, so this activity I actually took from a teacher who was using Seesaw and I used Google Slides. So I actually created a Google Slide that I can then use the Google LTI and embed it right into the Canvas course so the students don't have to go anywhere. They can go to Canvas, go to the assignment, and here it is. And this is a, a drag and drop type activity. So I designed this um, Google Slide as a way to, I can keep the coins there, but just change the cent value. And all the students have to do is with their mouse or with the iPad is click and drag the cents over to, to, to show the amount that I'm asking for. And you'll see where I can actually have a screencast as a teacher where I'm talking to them and not just talking to them, I can actually be demonstrating what to do. Oh, and one thing I'll point out is so then when the students submit this, in Canvas, the teacher can actually get a quick screenshot of what the kids submitted and check their work. So it's just a way to um, demonstrate or see what they're doing. And in SpeedGrader, teachers have the option to actually give an actual score, or they can mark things as complete or incomplete. It can be that basic. So Nearpod, if you're not aware, Nearpod is something that we have a district license for. In fact, the state is actually paying for the licenses for K-12 ed um, educators. So with Nearpod, teachers are able to create live participation or even student-paced student sessions. The difference is with live participation, the teachers have control over how students can go forward or backward, or student-paced ses sessions they can control their own pace. So the example you're seeing on the screen is something by Heidi Turner, who actually um, used Nearpod to support her spiral reviews. So she actually has this set up where the students will actually try out one of the, the um, problems and on the next screen, they can check their answer. And this could be something that the students just do independently and then it's done, or she can actually embed this as an assignment and she can actually have them submit and she can get an overall um, kind of like a, a snapshot of what they did and how they answered questions. Um, but with Nearpod, there's a lot of formative assessment opportunities and opportunities to respond, such as um, there's quiz questions, there's draw it opportunities where they can actually draw right on the screen. Um, a teacher can ask a poll, matching pairs, time to climb. Um, I think one example that I didn't list that elementary teachers were like, wait, you missed it. There's some drag and drop activities that can be integrated right into the Nearpod. Um, Nearpod does provide the opportunity to create some VR field trips, which can be pretty interesting. Um, the Nearpods can be embedded right on a content page or they can be assigned through an assignment. And like I said, on this screen where the teacher can actually get um, kind of like a, a report of how that student did on that specific assignment. 
So here's another example coming from Heidi where she actually has a, a fact and opinion activity, a screencast that the kids will watch. They know what to do. They're getting the directions. And then you can actually see how do they do on fact versus opinion. So with the specific student, I could look and say, you know what, I think we need to kind of work on what's a fact and opinion. So during some independent work time, I can pull the student back and maybe work one on one with them. And in this example, it's a morning meeting example that I actually took from a kindergarten teacher who was going to try this this year. And so I just took her idea and then I used one of the Canvas templates that we have to use the images so I didn't have to create my own. So what she's planning to do is a Canvas assignment that's linked from the homepage. So think about that homepage I showed where there's a morning meeting um, link. The kids come here, they find their cartoon character, like maybe I'm the bumblebee. I'm going to watch the screencast and that screencast is going to have directions. And so the example the teacher was going to do, she was going to have them do something with literacy, like have them every day work on a specific skill. And they were just going to resubmit the same assignment. And they're going to use the um, screen, the media recording where they can actually record themselves saying it. And each month she's going to update this. This is just the September morning um, work. And every day the kids will come in, they'll submit their assignment, and then she'll have this log of all of their submissions. And so I'm thinking even at parent teacher conferences, she could sit with the parents and say, here's how your students have been doing on this specific skill. Here's where they were September 1st. Here's where they are on September 30th. So you can see like the growth or maybe there's some areas that they still need to work on. So just an idea, but maybe you can see how what this idea is and it sparks another idea of how you can use something like this. So when it comes to modules, modules is completely optional. Um, I like I, the idea of using modules as a way to organize content, um, if, especially if there's, if there's content I want students and parents to be able to access. Um, so if I'm linking things from my homepage, what do I do if I'm maybe a month or two into school and there's other content pages I want them to be able to go back to and see. That's where modules can really be helpful. So modules, they organize course content. Once again, I say, think about your audience. Um, something that we've liked recommending the teachers use is providing visual representations, the example of emojis. And these are the same emojis you would have on your phone. So like um, the smiley face, the square, anything you can have visual. And I love sharing this example. Um, I had a third grade teacher who was coming in over the summer for our Canvas Tech, our Canvas Geek Squad. And she was sharing with me that she had started using emojis for her. It was her way to remember, okay, when I see the eyeglasses, this is what that one means. So it was kind of like her visual cue. And over time, her students picked up on that and it became visual cues for them as well. So those visual cues can be really beneficial specifically for our younger kids. Um, when using your module, you want to limit the amount of content if they're too long, like that content page, people tend to get confused, overwhelmed, and they tune out. But then ideas for um, using modules, you can create a module for maybe each subject, depending on how the teachers are using their Canvas courses, maybe for each week with the most recent week at top, on the top. Um, maybe it's a, a module for each day of the week, so maybe not each week of the school year, but maybe it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, and maybe provide a module that's specific for parents and guardians that you can um, provide material to. So here's the first example. Um, it looks familiar because it's the example that was shared during the skill-based instruction station rotation example. But this teacher, you can see where she's using them for her ELA centers, her math centers, and then she has family information. I added the emojis just to provide that specific um, visual cue so you can see what that, that looks like. And with the emojis, it's as simple as I tell teachers, I just Google Emojipedia, go to the website, find the emoji I want, and it's copying and pasting it into here. It's not a hard process. And I, said, I Google it every time. Uh, the second module this is where it's organized by week. You'll see where I do have visual cues, um, those emojis for those visual cues. Um, I always like starting a week at a glance. If I do organize things by week, I like having that week at a glance just so I can say, hey, here's what we're doing this week. Um, but it can be as simple and as basic as you want. And once again, I have my family module just because I want to, my parents to know, hey, this information specifically for you. So a lot of information shared in a very short amount of time. But once again, here is our must do's versus our can do's. And like I said, it's okay if our elementary teachers only use just the um, homepage. 
but thinking of that of how they can use this Canvas course to really help students and parents stay connected to the learning, up to date and information, and that help that consistency with the Canvas use in our district. Um, if you haven't watched our Canvas for Elementary opt in bite size PD yet, I recommend that you do so. It's a new feature that's been released by Canvas that um, I see huge potential with um, our elementary students, parents, and, and teachers. Um, because the way we use Canvas in elementary is different than our middle schools and high schools. Um, and talking with my colleagues from Davis, Ogden, and Jordan School District, they just turned this on and kind of pushed their teachers into the deep end. And they said it's been very well accepted. Um, teachers have really liked it. Um, the only caveat is for anyone who's already been using Canvas, um, it moves the cheese just enough, meaning some of the buttons or icons are in different locations. A lot of the processes are the same. They don't lose any content, but it just moves your cheese enough that it can be a little like, oh gosh, I have a lot to learn. So that's why I didn't feel comfortable just turning this on for our district this year. But I also um, want to allow teachers to try this out. So I do have some teachers trying it out this year, giving us feedback. So then we can decide, is this the way we need to go with Canvas for our K-5 teachers, students, and parents? So if you're looking for another bite-sized PD to watch, I recommend watching this because I'd love to get your feedback and even questions that you have regarding this. So thank you for watching this bite-sized PD. Here are some links just to keep you aware of. Um, the first link is to our Canyons U page. It has a lot of different how-tos um, that we've shared for, for teachers and coaches. Um, a direct link to our Canyons U bite-sized PD page. This is specifically what we share for teachers. We started this last year, so you'll see there's access to last year's um, PD and this year. And then if you're interested in getting your licensure credit for watching this, feel free to um, fill out the form. We award it once a month on Midas. And then that is the, bot the last link is a direct link to this presentation if you want to have direct access to this presentation again. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.